it's kind of heavy when you start getting that kind of introduction. Uh, <laughs> I'll start this talk by saying that when I was first a postdoc at the other institute, Oppenheimer used to tell us what we don't understand, we explain to each other. And I intend to live up to that axiom. <laughs> and I also intend to not take any questions from any of the people in the front row if I could avoid it. Because, <laughs> being, oh my God, all of them are here, yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe I should sit down right now. But this talk, seriously, well, Tony, of course, uh, is a sinner in this respect. I looked at this paper before I came here, Gravity and Its Mysteries, Some Thoughts and Speculations. That could be an alternate title, of course, for anybody. Uh, <clears throat> So honestly, I am going to speak at a level which will bore anybody over the age of whatever it is. Maybe the other ones too, but at least the intention is to... <laughs> okay, Jim. <laughs> yeah. I'll, call, I'll count you as a junior. <laughs> so I'll give you a vague review um, of uh, quantum gravity in small increments which will start from zero and then probably not too much further but you get the general idea and I will immediately say that honestly I'm not going to for example say one word about string theory which is a somewhat relevant subject simply because this is a one-hour colloquium and uh, there, are, there are its limits so uh, this is going to be a review of the problems possible glimmers of hope or flashes of desperation which go through people who, who work on quantum gravity. So I'll spend some of my time, though, as a tu in a tutorial. Can this focus? Yeah. So I'm going to first teach you what classical gravity is. You should never take anything for granted. And then um, what is quantum gravity? And what are we worried about? And the fourth question, what is and are the cures? I wouldn't hold my breath in this lecture. but you'll at least see some of the scope of some of the problems. So, uh, and I encourage questions from rows two on. Okay, so what is it that we think we want to quantize? That's my first, uh, as a start, this is the boring part for the pros. Uh, let's forget geometry. It just a lousy special relativistic field theory like a scalar field. Is there such a thing as a pointer? Yeah, a scalar field or a Maxwell field, it's just got a bunch of indices, so it's a tensor field, that's not so hard, the free part of which is the usual Klein-Gordon form, plus ominous dot, dot, dots. And the reason we need a tensor field uh, and cannot simply rest on Newton's laurels with a scalar field is that the only source that you can think of that, ex that generalizes uh, mass density in the Newtonian case is the, and there's only special, this is all special relativity, is T mu nu, the stress density whose <clears throat> time time component is the energy density with some sign. And this is the matter stress tensor is conserved, of course, for a closed system, uh, which is a, actually the beginning of the problems that this field, that's hence the dot, dot, dots, as you will see. So it all sounds very simple, boring Maxwellian. And it stays that way for a little while, but then all hell breaks loose. So how does it break loose? Well, the first thing is, of course, we have, having invented this tensor we, uh, to be the source of this other tensor with a dimensional coupling constant, uh, just like box A equals EJ, except um, I urge you to think right now about dimensions, just plain old engineering dimensions. Uh, field in four dimensions, always length, inverse length. So the left side is three lengths below. T mu nu is an energy density, so there's a missing power of L, and G, the coupling constant, uh, gives us that power, and that's the first uh, the symptom, although it's no small, no bigger than a man's hand at this point, but it's the first symptom of what's going to kill us. The coupling constant here, unlike the square root of alpha, is highly dimensionful. And this disease, by the way, was recognized way back in the early 30s, quite apart from general relativity. Okay, 
Now, the first, and, and, and so I'm gonna, let me talk about the good news a little bit. The first beautiful, very beautiful thing is that as soon as you see box instead of del square, that means there are degrees of freedom beyond the role of the Newtonian potential, just as they are, of course, for Maxwell. And that means that there are gravitons, which are going to be our real challenge. But at the same time, as I say, the reason we have to pursue this path is that it explains a whole qualitative range of facts, in particular the fact that gravity is attractive between like masses, and all masses, are, of course, are positive and like all energies. <clears throat> and the reason for that is entirely to be seen in, or can at least be traced to, the, the necessary existence of gravitons. If you've got something that oscillates, like photons, you need that minus a quarter, in the, as you all know from high school, in the uh, Maxwell action, or at least in, in my metric, um, <clears throat> which is defined by that fact. And um, to get positive energy photons, that is to say, with this minus sign, you get plus a dot squared, and that's what you want for positive energy. And there, it automatically gives repulsion between like charges, uh, irrespective of, that is, the couple, whatever the sign of the coupling constant, either either the same or opposite, so they attract, they repel or attract respectively because the Coulomb potential <clears throat> minus one with L square is a positive operator. So we are forced here uh, by, for gravity, that is, this is all tree level stuff, cl classical stuff, we're forced in order to have plus h dot squared to fix the sign of the Lagrangian, which I've written to you, so that the matter-matter interaction has the opposite sign that it has a Maxwell. And that's simply a function of how many zeros we're talking about. A current has one zero, this has two zeros. So that's the, the interaction energy, and it's negative. So all masses and energies interact. And this is one of the, what should I say, underappreciated facts about GR. It's giving you this whole infinite number of very, I mean, this huge qualitative knowledge um, about, which of course agrees with observation. Now, the catch is that everything attracts, and when matter interacts with gravity, it's a longer closed system, its stress sensor is no longer conserved, and it's just because of lack of isolations, unlike photons, which are uncharged, electrically neutral, gravitons weigh, everything weighs. After all, when I've got this a dot squared there, h dot squared, I see energy and I'm in trouble. So whereas the linearized theory, that what we started from, box h plus dot dot dot, is gt is fine to lowest order because this side is conserved, neglecting interaction, this side's identically conserved, it breaks down immediately when matter's dynamical. So we have to do something, and that's the path that's going to, of course, lead to both perihelion precession and infinities. So now we've got to modify this story by adding the t mu nu of, uh, of gravity to the t mu nu of matter. That's the total system, there's gravitons and everything else. If you add the two together, then uh, you got to, so you want to know what is the t mu nu of this system? Well, we have been taught for hundreds of years, or 100 years anyway, how to evaluate the stress sensor of a special relativistic system. It's just grad h squared, so it's some kind of grad h grad h sub mu nu, some, not quite, but almost. And you add, in order to get that, you've got to add this cubic term to the Lagrangian to get this equation with this stress sensor. But, of course, L1 has itself got a stress sensor. And we're off to the races because now you need a cubic Lagrangian, a cubic stress tensor addition, a quartic L2, two H's, and powers of the coupling constant, which I have spared you. And soon you have an infinite series where I have not spared you the sign of G. It's a power series in GH, which is a dimensionless quantity times the kinematical term. Now, hand-waving hand uh, arguments say this is GR, but that's never really been proven this way, and you can't tell. Infinite series may not even converge, let alone to poor Einstein-Hilbert. So you, I'll give you a quick derivation instead, in case you're lost in a desert island, there's a one-step way to get general relativity 
without any thinking, which doesn't mean you can solve it any better, but at least you can remember it. So I'll spend one transparency on that. Okay, so I'm going to write general relativity in a form that Einstein and Hilbert did not, but a guy called Palatini did around about early 20s or whatever it was, which is to, of course, any physicist perfectly clear, it's Hamiltonian form. You have a pair of variables, a g and something called gamma with three indices, and forgetting anything else, you see that this is a cubic, it's a quadratic term and a cubic term, and that's all. So it's like pq dot minus p squared plus some extra qp squared correction. <laughs> and specifically, we start with a free spin to field in this fancy first order of form. You get these field equations by varying um, gamma and h. And then uh, to get the equation you want, which is the t mu nu of the whole gravitational field, you've got to add one lousy term to this quadratic expansion here. So remember, you start in flat space. This is a Minkowski metric, gamma gamma plus hd gamma. I claim that by adding this one lousy term, our old friend H from over here, that this A does not yield any further corrections because it's already perfectly good scalar density as it says, nothing to vary. And at the same time, it gives you exactly the right-hand side you want. So that's it. So that's QED. You now have found the Einstein action without ever hearing the words curvature. F well, or even affinity for that matter. So this is what we must quantize. Having found this theory, now we've got to expand it back because the only thing we know how to do is quantize perturbatively and, and uh, within quantum field theory. <clears throat> and so we've now got to figure out uh, what it is that we want to quantize and how. Well, that's easy. All the textbooks tell you how to quantize fields, right? Well, for that, you just need, in principle, the free part and you write PQ as I, or minus I, whatever it is, and you're off. So now we come to chapter two, quantum gravity. Quantum gravity, as I said, you just quantize the full nonlinear theory with the usual equal time commutators between I write h and h dot prime. That's a technical lie. It's a horrible, complicated mess, which we all, well, the front row knows, and the rest don't have, mercifully, don't have to. But it's essentially no more than this, except that the operators on one side are transverse traceless, but that's just a technicality. So, so the hard part is not figuring out what the quantum, uh, uh, how to get to the operators, uh, that's not an obstacle. After all, great Yang-Mills theory is also nonlinear. By the way, it can be written as PQ dot minus uh, Q cubed, so uh, plus minus P squared minus uh, Q cubed. So it's a cubic theory here, in fact, a quartic theory in this form. But what makes it happy is that the self-coupling constant, as you can immediately see, is dimensionless because an A has the dimensions of a gradient by consistency, so G has no dimension. So that's the end of that story, whereas we are slogging along with a lousy infinity of terms. And with that dimension full constant, which as I said, in Planck, we may as well use Planck units now that we're quantizing anyway, uh, that's um, uh, power of inverse mass or, or length, whatever you like. So let's talk diagrams. Um, um, and by the way, one of the lessons we're learning for very new stuff, which I'll mention at the end, is we shouldn't talk diagrams because diagrams in, in quantum uh, gravity are the most horrendously exponentially rising mess you can possibly imagine. At the end of the day, all the calculations that have been done uh, 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 boiled down to a few simple, that is, scattering amplitudes are, in fact, incredibly simple when you get through it. So there must be a pony somewhere, and people are finding, finding ways that go beyond, completely beyond Feynman diagrams and, the, the, and find this stuff. This originated, actually, in Yang-Mills theory.
But anyway, uh, we're not there yet. So let's, let's take the baby step. That'll show us what's wrong. So here are the diagrams. And uh, <clears throat> the, the usual story, the quadratic term gives us a propagator, which is some kind of 1 over p squared. But these are tensor fields. They have some garbage in the numerator, but that doesn't matter. Uh, <clears throat> and then we have vertices. The trouble is we don't just have cubic vertex or quartic vertex. We have n-body vertices all the way up the line from expanding this, uh, this sum. Now, if you just want to ask basic, simple questions like Compton scattering of two gravitons, fine, that's no problem. Um, at the lowest order, they use one of these vertices, say, to exchange uh, a force between them, and they scatter from 1, 2 to 1 prime, 2 prime. Uh, anyone who's ever, ever done this calculation in the hard way will quickly see how horrible things get. I mean, it's really a, a, the, it's a pain, at the end of which the Compton amplitude is, I mean, you sort of feel the way Klein and Nishina must have felt back in 26 and, uh, no, 29, I guess. But anyway, uh, it's, it's perfectly finite. It's, uh, everything is, of course, all three level diagrams are finite. So quantum gravity has no problems without loops because you're not integrating. If you don't integrate, you don't have virtual states. If you don't have virtual states. Who's going to hurt you? Everything's fully determined. So that's not the problem. But um, that's true, as I said, of all trees. If you're stupid enough to want to know how three gravitons turn into three or 17 gravitons, you can even do that. God help you. But I mean, you will not have to do any integration. So there is no, no trouble. So where do things start going bad or wrong? Well, you all know the answer. What comes after trees? You get the loops. Now, here I would have liked to, maybe I'll use another transparency to, uh, to do that. Loops are. Of course, always a problem quantum field theory. Let's say this first, I've just drawn a random thing, the first correction to, to Compton scattering, why not? In which a graviton uh, turns into a graviton loop. This could also be a matter loop inside, of course, because gravity couples with everything. So you've got to take into account all loops. But let's take the hardest one, which is uh, uh, all of, all of uh, the <clears throat> purely internal graviton loop. Now. Let's first, my main aim is, of course, uh, I don't want to dazzle you with how they actually look index-wise. I want to dazzle you or depress you with account of how, what the ultraviolet behavior of this is. That is to say, um, what happens if you take into account all possible virtual states. Why do I have to do that? Well, as you know, uh, this cute little bubble is shorthand it's Feynman bubble is shorthand for a virtual process with in intermediate states characterized by all possible, in this case, well, spin and momentum, but it's momentum that's our problem. So we've got to face, face that. So summing over virtual momentum means a D4P, of course, for the summation. And then we've got to simply slog through, as you all know how to do diagrams, I have two denominators, a p squared and a p plus k squared. I'm fairly sloppy with the external momenta because that's not what interests us. So it's, the, it's the virtual ones that are going to kill us, so who cares about that. So I have um, these two guys downstairs, one for each uh, member of the loop. And then I have those two blobs at the edges, which are the vertices. And we, let's spend a second about that. Uh, there are two vertices, which depend on p plus k, p plus k prime, whatever we're going to have. Vertices are momentum dependent here for the first time, unlike electrodynamics, because remember our coupling is h d gamma d gamma, uh, h, h uh, d h d h, and each d is a momentum, and of course a momentum space. So each of these v's has a vicious, as we will see, quadratic, positive quadratic dependence on, on momentum, which means that 
if I count it all up, I have a D4P up here. That's, I'm going strictly looking at the ultraviolet and high momentum and never mind the bottom. I have a G squared, by the way, because each blob has a G right here. Um, and then I have P fourth in the bottom, as I say, in the high limit, and a couple of P squares upstairs. Well, you count it up and you find a quartic infinity. Now, at this point, nobody throws up their hands particularly. We, infinities are what everyone who was born beyond a certain time simply takes for granted as a price of admission. So we don't mind, we don't mind infinities. The question is uh, how we can finesse them. And as I said, we've learned that from electrodynamics, you need counter terms. That is to say, if an infinity tries to bite you, the price you pay is putting in an indeterminate term into the action, like uh, delta mass term for the electron or charge, roughly speaking, for the current, for the charge uh, coupling. And these terms that are there in order to compensate for the infinities, the price you pay, and that's important, is that you are not allowed to ask any question about the mass of the electron or the charge or its charge. Those are off limits. We have to feed them in. I say this in a very ominous way because, of course, we're all happy to accept that in order to get the G minus 2 for the mu 1 to all those decimal places. But you'll soon see that that paradise does not carry over here. So <clears throat> those were lousy logarithmic terms. I remind you the same loop in electrodynamics looks the same except for the fact that the vertices don't depend on momentum. So you then have D4P over P4, and that's it. So that's a log. Well, quartic is worth in a log. And the dimensions of the, G, of the Gs force a counter term that should be uh, <clears throat> of order h to the fourth, actually partial h to the fourth, plus dot, dot, dot. Well, you know, you can't win them all here. You have to, what's so far doesn't look much wor or any worse than this. It's just a slightly different kind of infinity. But it, only it isn't. And so let me pause for a second and, 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 and say wh where we are. We are trying to do what our ancestors did for QED. Gee, I was one of those ancestors. But anyway, you, <laughs> our ancestors did for QED, except we're doing this in disgusting, more complicated story. I'll come, I'll come later to why, uh, to motivation, I mean, why we feel we have to do quantum gravity. But let me first get you into the disaster side. So, so um, uh, OK, we've got infinities. Um, how much, what will the price be? Electrodynamics, the price is essentially these two numbers. Again, I'm simplifying, but that's, that's really the whole story. And of course, uh, in uh, Professor Gross's domain, things are even better in, 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 in uh, Yang-Mills theory. Uh, but we should only be so lucky here. It's much, much worse. So what happens? So you need a counter term, and now I'm going to use a little uh, geometry on you, that is to say, to tell you what such a quartic counter term is. It is some number times infinity to the fourth, but never mind that, times infinity times r mu nu alpha beta squared. r mu nu alpha beta squared is just a fancy word for two derivatives on our old friend h mu nu quantity squared, so nothing, double gradient of, of h. So now we go, let's go to two loops having this. So this, we have paid, we are supposed to pay this price of admission in pure gravity. I'm talking about gravity without sources. It's similar. Uh, we'll soon talk about matter as well. But pure gravity to one loop, I have an infinity. Actually, there are three possible such terms, but never mind. They're all, they're all the same, really. Now, at two loops, Two loops simply means you take the previous diagram, for example, and cut it up with another virtual uh, set of states down the middle of that. So now you have, it's called two loops because you notice you have two sets of independent virtual addition summations over intermediate states. So you've got to do it twice. Well, so what? You've done it once, you can do it twice. But let's count. So 
one D4P for this one, one D4P for that one, okay? How many propagators? Well, this time we really were gaining in a big way. Instead of two, we got one, two, three, four, five. So that's P to the 10th, that looks reassuring. However, there are four of those evil black dots there. Each one is a P squared. So you add it all up or multiply it all up and you get P to the 6. The important thing is not even so much that as you now have a G squared and compared to the first term. This has no G in it, by the way, this counter term. This term has a G squared. It's R cubed, which means DH, DH cubed with indices uh, contracted in, et cetera, R fourth at three loops. This is actually a very famous uh, 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 term and level, which I will mention something about. But you see what happens. There's a cascade. Cascade in that we have an infinite number of unknown counter terms, as if instead of Einstein and Hilbert happily exchanging postcards that just have this lousy monovial, now the size of the postcard increases indefinitely with loop level, and you have to have a whole infinite series of, by the way, more and more convoluted uh, counter terms. I've written this, but of course, anytime you think of R to the N, I guess it can be seen on this side. If you see R to the N, you mean it could also be R to the N minus 1 with a couple of derivatives inside, maybe symbolically, or all the way down to R, and then a whole bunch of derivatives times R to the N minus 2 or something. So, so it's a whole series of infinite terms, all of them, um, all of them present in principle, all of them needing a counter term, so each one, as I say, um, at each loop there is a cascade, and you lose all predictive power. That is to say, if I ask you, tell me what quantum gravity tells me about the scattering of two gravitons, or even, you know, emission from binary pulsar, what have you, any question is such that the quantum corrections to it preclude any finite no answer. I have to absorb all the information to these lousy coefficients, and there's, so the theory, the, the theory just isn't in that sense. I mean, what good does it do to have this charming postcard and all those wonderful tree-level things when uh, you've lost all predictive power? And the root, as I say, is one that was first really discovered by Heisenberg back in a totally different context in the mid-30s and which is also familiar from Fermi theory of weak interactions, that is to say, uh, you can have there, Fermi invented this theory with instantaneous four fermion interactions, instead of knowing about all the great stuff that was to come. And he knew the prize for that was having an evil coupling constant that just blew up in your face. And, uh, but nobody cared, because I mean, Fermi knew that that was just the first step into the brave new world of the standard, or would it? I'm sure Fermi was smart enough to even understand that. So I mean, so, so in his case, nobody felt too unhappy. It was a quick, catalog, a quick explanation of, well, not even explanation, a quick cataloging of the weak interaction phenomena in one very simple effective term. And of course, effective theory, about which I'll say a few words, is a wonderful tool. Not only is it a wonderful tool, as far as I'm concerned, I think it's pretty well the only tool. All of physics is one painful step from one effective theory to the next. So uh, uh, you might say, OK, uh, we're unhappy, but after all, um, uh, this is maybe not the last word. And of course, I, this is also not the end of the, of the colloquium. But anyway, this is, this is certainly the end of Act Two, in the sense where everything is that could go wrong has gone wrong. And um, uh, there is within the, within the framework of general relativity as such, um, there is, I think, a general consensus that I, I'll mention a couple of exceptions, a general consensus that it's, while this is, of course, purely perturbative, it's also, uh, purely perturbative is not a pejorative term. That's how we do, we do field theory. 
So that, okay, so I've scared you. Now first I'll scare you a little bit more by saying, what really happens? Okay, all these infinities are possible. Do they all happen? Maybe, who knows, we're just not smart enough. There's a miracle, what we think is a miracle, and there, there's a zero in front of all these infinities. And then somebody will say, aha, that's because, and then we're off and we figured everything out. So, <clears throat> and the very first thing that happens, uh, I'm not, I've not really done much attribution here because it's just too many papers, too many decades. But the, the very first thing that happened was the one loop, the first one loop uh, calculation, pure gravity with no sources, was found, was understood by Veltman, at Hoft and Veltman, uh, back in the early 70s, very early 70s, to be okay. And the reason it was okay, not that the number in front of this was zero, does not happen, but it doesn't matter what the number in front of this. There's a, this happens to be accidentally a four-dimensionally uh, what is called field redefinable away term. That is to say, for special reasons that are not very arcane, but anyway, not very relevant, you can uh, do a clever under the sweeping under the rug of this particular infinity. And so to one loop order, life is good for pure gravity. However, so the next step was Boy, it was tough to be a graduate student in those days because, of course, the next step was you guys go out and do two loops. And two sets of guys went and did two loops. And, of course, nobody believed, would have believed either one, including themselves. But um, Marcus and Sanyati and then uh, Van de Ven, uh, did this uh, somewhat later. A horrible number. I mean, if, if I urge anyone who it's a subject to look at this, those calculations. They were, uh, they were just horrible. Amazingly enough, although done in different gauges on purpose and all sorts of different technicalities, they both agreed that is to say, it's been looked at later. It's very interesting because not only is this coefficient of two loops, which is g r cubed, not equal to zero, but in fact, the numbers they got were the same number, which is truly amazing because, as I say, did in different gauge. I mean, the, when you apply the proper dictionary, they agree completely. So there's no loophole. No loophole, two loops was done. And by the way, even at one loop, there was a series of horrible calculations to which I had the honor to be associated in which we did all possible internal matter loops. That is, uh, scalars, spinners, photons, and God help us, Yang Mills fields. We thought the magic of non-abelian gauge theory. All of them were calculated, no miracles. Not only were they infinite, but even then at one loop, you could not play the under the rug game. So this was really a very, it wasn't even so much depressing, it was just confirming. Of course, someone will say, but starting at 18 loops, everything goes well again, and to which I can only answer good luck. I mean, it's, uh, nobody's ever going to calculate three loops pure gravity. I think I'd be willing to bet that. Or at least if they do, I wouldn't trust what comes out. So, uh, <laughs> and I wouldn't trust whoever put their graduate students onto a disgusting thing like that. So, what are the, okay, so here we are. This is now really the end of Act Two. I mean, things are really desperate. and. Uh, by the way, this is not a happy ending drama, so, uh, but in any case, <laughs> what are the possible solutions? Well, there are many open paths. That's the good news, of course. I mean, the face space is large. So I'm not going to try to be cute about it. Let me see what the possible things are. The first thing, I forget what all these psychological stages, but the first stage is denial, of course, <laughs> which is to say, of course, we should never have quantized GR in the first place. Let it stay classical. And by the way, some very eminent people, whose names I will not divulge here, have published long ago papers, and occasionally it still comes up, urging this point of view, that is to say, well, if a theory looks bad as a quantum theory, keep it classical. But that's, it has been analyzed very carefully. How? Well, for example, the left side is a classical field, is G field. <clears throat> this is the Einstein tensor, so okay. So the right side is this coupling constant times some expectation value of the source with this in background classical field. Now this, 
aside from its other charms, is both inconsistent and violates quantum mechanics because you can basically violate the uncertainty principle, and people have written papers about that, uh, by using this G classical as an external source and actually beating the DPDQ. So it's, as you can well imagine, just putting expectation values already is pretty fishy. What state, what, what defines things. So it's, it's not, I can't even say nice try, but it certainly <coughs> lives up to its name, or the name I give it. Now, the next thing is, well, if you've, denial doesn't work, how about acceptance? Uh, so what? Uh, <coughs> After all, these are just infinity. These infinities only kick in at Planck length, because after all, I've omitted to tell you, of course, that quantum, that strictly speaking, the parameter of quantum gravity is an extremely tiny length, the usual 10 to the minus 30 something, depending on your units, or 10 to the minus fifth grams, which is what we used to call it in the old days. But in any case, not a very um, unshowly quantity. But on the other hand, that doesn't mean that you can't say so what, because the infinities really affect all processes. And besides, uh, in the early universe, there are those, not only does QG matter, but there are indications that actually the inhomogeneities, and I'm not giving a lecture on cosmology either, as you're, since you have a school <laughs> subject, but, but I mean, QG certainly cannot be simply waved away by saying nobody cares and we'll never see those effects. Yes, you will not see in, 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 you will not see graviton Compton scattering, but that's not really the way physics proceeds. You have a fundamental theory, you have to understand it. What other possibilities? Well, homeopathic. <laughs> you try to make small changes, see if it's a word, actually, you have to be a California to learn what words like that mean. I have to admit on the East Coast we didn't know. But anyway, uh, uh, it means can you do small changes within GR that may cure you, it. For example, different formalism, there's something called loop quantum gravity, which is, has a large living movement in which people believe that by using the appropriate variables, loop non-local variables in terms of the metric that these infinities will go away. It is a very difficult and arduous subject. There's another line which is called asymptotic safety, which is also, uh, which is, I shouldn't say also, which is alluring and it's still alive. Uh, this was first proposed by Steve Weinberg in a moment of despair in his early 70s, in which he said, and he still, by the way, of course, interested in it, that perhaps what happens is that there is a, the, the renormalization path is such that there are fixed points so that even though everything I told you is true, it's kind of irrelevant because the theory finds its way to a finite point. And that's, to put it mildly, very hard to determine, although there are continually uh, papers written on that score. There's also uh, lattice gravity. You say, well, space time is discrete and not continuous, so once you say the word discrete, of course, you don't have the upper, you, your integral becomes a sum, and things are very much safer, but again, although there are people working on that, and I think, you know, a thousand flowers certainly should bloom, there is no, there is not much agreement for what it's worth in the community, those are likely good directions. Now, so we go deeper. <laughs> GR is an effective theory like phonons. It's a valid way up there where things go wrong, where the correct theory takes over. And of course, there are enough people in this front row, box, other places who were in there doing string theory from the word go and know that that, that of course is one of the major attractions of that system. That is to say, once all this is, let me again repeat, this is within now the statement that poor Riemann was just a nice kid, but I mean things, you know, space time isn't really that, there's something deeper. One of the deeper things, and there are of course many string theory, was practically weaned on closed strings on the fact that, that spin two uh, excitations were, 
were automatically part of the content of the model. And of course, it being a, a non-local theory in that specific sense, uh, the, the infinities that we talk about here don't, don't matter. Now, so it incorporates GR in some sense. It stays phi that in some sense. But as we all know, uh, I can, it is hard to believe right now that at least the string theory we all know um, is, is yet likely to be, is, is at least in its present form, a well understood answer to the question. So these are just uh, deeper possibilities. Now, it certainly isn't the end all model of anything, uh, space time that is, and, and it. What, what do you really mean by the Jura's law? By what? On the, stri on the string framework as a framework for oh. unified theory, or on the fact that it incorporates GR in space time? On, the, on that statement, it's incorporated. There are two statements. The jury is not out. No, no, jury's not out on that statement. But if that statement, right, but it's meant to be, a, sorry, the jury is out on string theory as a theory of more that's out there besides finite gravity. I knew somebody would get me on that one. And uh, um, again, I can only plead finite transparencies. I agree completely, and I never, that is to say, yes, what Professor Gross is reminding us of is that <clears throat> there is no doubt, well, I won't go into what, I, what string theory for which we don't really have a complete dynamical variable framework, but it is indeed true that it is, instead of a point theory, a one-dimensional theory, its X spectrum, infinite spectrum of excitations includes a massless spin two objects, which necessarily in their lowest manifestations have to be general relativity because going, that's why, haha, -ha, that's why I wrote my first slides, David, because to convince you that anything that is A consistent and B does have spin two uh, excitations, massless ones, must, those must be general relativity. That was not in 69, it was shown simply that they were spin two excitations and closed strings, that they had to be GR. Everybody was deeply convinced, but it's, that it's true has to be, that's the proof, basically. But in any case, I agree with that. However, I do not agree with the fact that that theory, see, it isn't as if you're selling me or it would, one is buying string theory as a theory of gravitation. Trouble is that string theory does have these other excitations, super string theory, and well, I think one could argue successfully the jury's out on, sorry, uh -oh, all the pros are <laughs> they're all against me, wait. GR is an effective theory. One could also add that there's a regime where it's not clear that string theory gives concrete answers and that's ultra high energy scattering. That's right, well that's right, that's your, so, yeah. no, I mean, yeah, I think one can argue and I would certainly be willing to do that even off this room that we are not yet at a level where we can go ahead and say string theory tells us and therefore this is what LHC will say. Come on, you want the standard model, David, you haven't got it. Let's just, let's just say it right there. So, okay. I wish, I mean, I have nothing against string theory and I've, I, I would be more than happy to, I wouldn't have had to give this talk if the jury weren't out on, on the string theories overall uh, uh, merits within the field that it claims to describe. Okay, but I knew this either way, this had to be faced. Okay, so I, I go ahead, you want to say more? We disagree much more than you think, okay. <laughs> so, there's another po currently popular idea is that space time's an emergent property. There's recent, very recently been a paper, for example, by Ferlinda, which I'm sure I've, a lot of people have seen, which claims, hey, this, all this stuff is just a lot of nonsense. It's really all came out of Boltzmann's brain and, and, and it's a derived concept. Uh, it's not quite clear to me, by the way, A, what it means. I mean, I'm, I'm no judge of religious theory. It's also not clear to me how it affects 
It's clear to me how string theory affects the, the infinities of GR. I agree on that. It's not clear to me how these other things, uh, these other things do. It really is a very uh, murky uh, subject. Now, let me come to other miracles. After I've covered other possibilities, let's talk about miracles. No rational physicist should be without them. Okay, so SUGRA. It's a subject which I've always enjoyed. Supergravity, which is gravity plus spin three halves fermions. Now, amazingly enough, that too enjoyed, I'm doing this historically now, in 1976, that is to say, um, many years after string theory was shown to include the graviton, uh, this modest turned out to be, of course, limit, a limit of, uh, field limit of, of string theory, um, <clears throat> in which there was a graviton of spin three halves fermion, perfectly quantum field theoretical theory, uh, theoretical model is safe. First of all, of course, it's mind-boggling. That's why I say miracles are going to save us eventually. Uh, this one looked like a miracle because who would ever think that against poor Mr. Riemann would team up with Marita Schwinger and uh, the, that there was a, 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 a local gauge invariance that tied the two. Now, more surprisingly, it is safe at one loop which is truly amazing because remember I told you pure gravity was safe in one loop, but not gravity plus matter, except gravity exactly for this matter. So things got, people got very happy very soon, and then they went on to two loops, and by God, it turned out that at two loops you were safe also. Now that's one loop more than even pure gravity was, so that's, and we all know Fermi's dictum, right, if it works a second order. It's true to all orders. Um, however, some of us unfortunately discover that at three loops, there, it's not shielded. And so A, it doesn't work at three loops, that is this particular called N equals one supergravity. And even the ultimate, D equals 11, the highest dimensional supergravity. Oddly enough, that was calculated because it first diverges out at two loop order much sooner, and it really does as an infinity. So, so far that looks like a direct washout, but there's a new hope and there's currently primarily actually on both sides of Santa Barbara and, and at UCLA and at uh, Slack, the, there is a um, very vigorous um, work which is, I mean, it, 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 if nothing else, it's formally absolutely amazing, which has to do with maximal supergravity and I feel at the very least having attempted to depress everybody at least, but David, that, that this, is a, this is certainly a, a real breath of fresh air. I guess I should disclose in the interest of whatever full disclosure that I have a large, small monetary bet on the outcome of this one, but <laughs> I will attempt to be objective and it's too small to worry about. In any case, I'm on, my bet is on the finite side for what it's worth. But in any case, this is a crazy theory. Everybody's known about it since uh, the late 70s, so the theory is not new. Now, what is it? It's, a ma it's called maximal n equals h supergravity. I will tell you in a second what it is, but it's a pure four-dimensional theory anchored at one end by ordinary Einstein, and instead of just one lousy spin three halves particle, it goes all out. It's got eight spin three halves particles, 28 vector particles, 56 spinners and 70 spinless particles altogether uh, forming one of these beautiful triangular series, all massless. So it is indeed out of this world that is almost no aspect of it is seen or will be seen by LHC on there, so it clearly is not an unbroken representation of the real world. But the amazing thing is, it has so far jumped through all the hoops, and I just want to show you some of the hoops, just because, just because, given the build-up as to how everything is impossible falls apart, anything that doesn't fall apart quite immediately is worth, um, I'll be fine on time, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and it, it, the technical reasons how, it work, how one can investigate it so well is it's closely connected to super four, uh, <clears throat> N equals four super Yang-Mills 
uh, twice. So, N equals four super Yang Mills is another subject I will not bore you with here, what with the 30 seconds remaining. But in any case, uh, <clears throat> because of this conspiracy between all these new particles, uh, that it's much easier to calculate that if you're smart like those people in northern and southern California, you, you, can, you invent methods of calculation which are just amazing in that the tens of 10 to the nth Feynman diagrams collapse into a small, I mean, it's, don't get me wrong, it's still horrible, but a small enough that one could actually calculate rather than even some little two loop thing. Now, so far, everything that has been calculated and understood, all amplitudes, up to, depending who you ask, four or five loops, are finite, and their whole series of diagrams, which are finite to all loops, which is really amazing, that is to say, you, they're very special kinds, only because that's what people can get their hands on. But every, in other words, if everywhere you look, it's finite, we all know that doesn't mean anything, but it sure is better than the opposite. So that's where it is so far. So no one has found an infinity yet. Every time these guys get a little further, somebody publishes and says, oh, yes, but you don't know that two loops later, here's a horrible thing that can happen. People have been saying that right now, the last warning loops that I have seen from some of my friends are up to nine loops. So uh, that's, that's, of course, well above my pay scale, so I don't know. But I mean, that's, that's where the dangers seem to be. But I say to myself, and I've been thinking about this, but not enough to be able to tell you anything interesting. What if we win? OK, suppose I, I make my retire on this infinite bet that I've just made. Well, I would get $1,000, but it's not quite enough to, to really make a difference. What if I win? What if the theory is finite? What has it got to do about the real non susie world? In other words, A, we haven't seen any of these particles. There are no massless particles out there except uh, the few that we all know and love. And, and so uh, if you break the symmetry, first of all, also the kind of multiples don't exist. Secondly, if you break the symmetry, it's no one has yet thought, nor should they, how the breaking of the symmetries would affect the finiteness. And, and, and a little bit I try to think about it, it's very, I'm very confused. But I mean, I would bet that if somebody actually shows that theory is finite, somebody else is going to show something. But at the moment, that's, that's all I can say. One other sci-fi question that I've been just out of sheer despair looking at, the nice thing about this one is that there are only three papers on the subject. High dimension, what happens if you go way the hell out to high infinite dimensions? Uh, as I say, only three intrepid people to date have written papers on it, and we don't know very much. The only thing that has struck me is, is that they get less threatening, that is to say the counter terms get pushed ahead, those things that block you from predicting anything, get pushed to higher and higher powers of curvature and derivatives, which means that they will leave us alone much longer, forever, of course, in the limit, compared to ordinary dimensional, uh, finite dimensional GR. Well, that's nice, but I don't think LHC will reveal that we live in an infinite number of dimensions either. So again, what lesson you can learn from this, I really do not know. But so let me end by saying, there really is no consensus yet as to the right answer theory to this specific fact. I mean, peace, as far as spin theory is concerned, it's certainly going to come out, it's going to finesse the question in a way that we just don't understand. And in the meanwhile, there are a lot of us in many places up and down the coast, or both coasts and in between, who are at least kept from being juvenile delinquents. Thank you very much. <laughs>Uh, especially from the younger people. Uh, yeah. Questions from students? Okay, Jim. Yeah, yeah I agree. He's honorary. Yeah, he's honorary. Yeah. 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 Person. Which quip is that? Which quip? About the back of the room? Andy Millis is in the back of the room. No, no, he means the, about being off the streets. Yeah. Of being a delinquent. Ah, well, I have to be careful. This is, I thought, a high energy colloquium, so I don't mean to say that it's any, any slurs on other, 
specialities of modern f <laughs> what was it that would Murray call it squalid state physics? squalid state, state. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the same people who would be juvenile delinquents within this area have something to do. That they should be doing something more interesting like condensed matter physics is, again, beyond my pay grade. So I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Peace. Uh, other questions? Questions? David probably wants to say something. Questions? Yeah. Yeah. So you say that the maximum supergravity has the finite form. You have the maximum supergravity. Yeah. That means the theory itself is finite. The theory itself is finite. That's the idea. I mean, it has not been proven. What has been proven within is that if you calculate in this theory, amplitude. Well, there are. The awful lot of lore and under, uh, not lore, an awful lot of technical understanding has developed about the classes of loop diagrams, order by order, which can be threatening and which are not there. The amazing thing is certain, I mean, it's really a technical fact that certain classes of diagrams that kill you all over the place are actually absent in n equals eight in, the, in this maximal theory. And that's truly strange. I mean, it's strange because you can't even say, aha, of course, it's got all this supersymmetry, so of course this can't be. It isn't like that. The, these guys have, have it's, they're building on, on, on a set of results for, as I say, super yang mills theory, which in some ways are very remote. So, but they've been able to show that whole classes of threatening diagrams never, never appear. Sorry. In the n equals eight example, what's been shown so far is anyone actually written down a, a uh, n equals eight um, supersymmetric counter term whose coefficient has been calculated. Ah, yes, absolutely. N equals eight, n equals eight uh, for loop counter term has been calculated explicitly, and the coefficient is. Zero. I was told that this would always be possible because there is no superspace formalism. Yeah. They, they were able to do it. In fact, just knowing that Professor Gross would ask me that question, I uh, asked, uh, Lance Dixon is one of the people I was referring to who's up at Slack, and he was just happened to be giving a talk at Brandeis yesterday. So I got the word, and what was he saying at his seminar? So he said, yes, specifically, zero n equals four. Ah, but when was was that yesterday? <laughs> yeah, no, I know. All I'm telling you is, look, I, I Lance has a has a uh, on show super space argument. I mean, on show. I I know. Look, look. No, no, no. I am. I have. I have not calculated the. Uh, absolute for loop, sorry. I have been told by usually reliable sources who have been involved in the calculation that it's true. Now, that doesn't mean that. There are two things. One is for loops being finite, and the other is has that, has anyone succeeded in writing down a counter term? Oh, if you can write, you can. Ah. Which should be there according to all the symmetry? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it, yes. In fact, in fact, uh, the R to the fourth is part of a complete n equals eight scalar. R to the fourth, the one that that, that horrible thing that started with. I mean, an n equals eight invariant. I mean that. You remember, I was telling you that uh, the infinities at one loop, you got R squared. Oh, great. And at two loops, this is all pure gravity. <laughs> two, you guys are really up to date here. Uh, maybe it'll write down what I want to say. Two loops, you have our cube possibility. 
In pure GR, this is there. That's there also, for that matter. And at three loops, pure GR, this has never been, it exists, and as I, in fact, I wrote a paper that showed the exact form of this invariant for n equals 0. That's clear. Now, what is, uh, so nobody knows, I mean, that, that it can be there. It has not been calculated. However, this term, which starts as r to the fourth plus garbage, this garbage can be written down for n equals, we wrote down way back for n equals 1 explicitly, has been not superspace. No, who cares? That something is an invariant under a, a local gauge transformation can be shown in many ways. It doesn't have to be superspace. I mean, superspace at n equals eight is a whole disgusting other subject. <laughs> I don't want to no, go. I yeah. I, but have you actually seen explicit or any Look, if you ask me to prove that what Svi and company have done to two loops is true, I couldn't. No, no. I understand. I believe that even I, in my unsuperspace ways, could, if I were forced to write down a uh, given what I understand from R to the fourth. See, it has a fund. The thing is, R to the fourth is just not any old R to the fourth. It has a very fundamental structure having to do with something called the Bell Robinson tensor. In other words, it's really something called R squared squared. And that R squared is fraught with kind of geometric uh, information. From that, one is able to extend the series at least for n equals 1 and for, for n equals In fact, we did it for n equals 2 also. Now, whether I can give you right down equals 8, the answer is no. That, go ahead. Just a related question. I thought the way that people were arguing that 9 loops is the new dangerous place yeah. is that there were a sort of sporadic argument. There's almost a superspace that gets you up to 8. That's loops. right. That's the right. The is it kills that's all possible. Right. So but it's almost. Uh, which would mean the <laughs> first counter term that's n equals 8 invariant would be at 9 loops. So is that not? No, 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 that's right. That's a superspace level argument. See, there are. Yeah, yeah. You see, that's right, that's right. The trouble is. David. The trouble is, there are these incredible sub schools at work here. There are people who say if it isn't, if it isn't superspace, I don't know what it means. Forget about you know not not manufactured here. And so if you talk to I me, mean, one of my ex students is a big superspace guy. And I can't get him to talk to me non superspace. All I'm saying is that the experts have told me that as of yesterday, for what it's worth, it is those guys, the California guys, agree now that they have a for, uh, 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 our fourth complete our fourth local counter term. In other words, there's something to be shot down. David, that's, you know, I, I, I am not going to go beyond my competence. I've already gone beyond my competence, so I will not go any further. But I think that's not really the danger. I don't think anybody's saying, even the guys who are anti, who are saying, ha ha, you, those guys don't even know if there's an R4 um, or not. I mean, that's, that's, not the, that's not the real problem, but so. Well, uh, perhaps, uh if this, uh, any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker. Yeah, well, that's always the trouble when you get a big.